Hey, it is Alexa, and you're listening or watching the Wish Beats podcast. And I thank you for being here. We are we are nearing in our mid 80s guests. I can't remember if this is 86, 87. That's a lot of awesome people that we've gotten to learn from. And, and that's why I do the podcast is that I actually get to interview people that I genuinely like, admire, and trust. And I know will give you incredible insights that will help you on your journey wherever you are. And Elizabeth Galen Baker was a bright light in a sea of strangers. And when I met her, I had felt that I had found a friend. Now, admittedly, when she laid eyes on me, one part of the story is she thought I looked like someone that she knew, but we have definitely realized in our getting to know one another that we're kindred spirits. And we have a shared vision of helping both ourselves and others reimagine themselves in this world, reimagine the world itself. And I am so excited for you to hear her story. Now, I have to preface this. When we jumped to the podcast, we we were like hitting the ground running. Normally, I sort of do a little you know, chit chat before we begin and then I officially launch into it. No, we just started talking and we were so in it before I realized that we haven't even introduced her. So you're just going to jump in after, you know, we're, you're just catching us like we hit the ground running. So it might seem a little bit tangential, but don't worry, stay with us because she has got some lessons for us, friends. She helps us, helps me, hopefully helps you see that there is so much that we don't know and don't understand. And when we can lean into that with some humility and curiosity, things can happen in our lives. We can be the vehicles for change that we so desperately want to see in the world. And so may today's guest recording delight you, surprise you. Um, It's going to be surprising when you look and see that she's one of the cast members of the insanely viral smash hit retirement house. She's one of six cast members uh, who literally, while they're, I believe she told me their ages range in, to 72 to 86, uh, they're jumping around like they're, you know, 19 years old. So um, there's a reason why her energy is infectious because there's some energy in her actual being that uh, that lights you up. So without further ado, just bear with us. We're going to just send you right into the conversation. This is Elizabeth Galen Baker. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, I, I take these podcasts really seriously because people hear them. I want, I want people to know that this is my road, but you have to find your own road. Yeah. You know, I'm not trying to tell people that they should do this or that. I'm just saying this is what worked for me. And I think that, I think the proof is of the pudding is whether or not you're at ground zero, whether you really stay at ground zero. It, you, have to, I, you, you really have to develop a muscle for ground zero. So oh. easy to get yeah. swept away, you know? You know what I want to talk about then, and we'll, we'll, we'll find our way there, but how you define ground zero. That's interesting to me. Okay. Um, So let's, we'll kick it off officially and we'll see where it goes. And I have no doubt that what will be shared will be just what's meant to be shared. Absolutely. Yeah. Oh, one thing I did want to ask you is, um, I know that you have Elizabeth Galen Baker is your full name. Do you go by Elizabeth Baker? How do you prefer to be introduced? Uh, Well, it, it got complicated because I never used anything but Galen Baker until I was about 50 years old. And then I had a dream and was instructed to use my whole name. And so I started using my whole name, but it's clunky. No one can say Elizabeth Galen. So when I'm making movies or when I'm writing books or screenplays, I use Elizabeth Galen Baker. And when I'm acting, I use Galen Baker because there's so many Elizabeths. Interesting. And so now, of course, it's gotten ridiculous, complicated. I, you know. Well, I don't find it so, so complicated, but I can say Elizabeth Galen Baker. Well, you can say that, but when you're talking to me, I guess since, since it's about 
acting and whatnot now, we can say Galen Baker. I I love I but I love both these women and I don't want to make either one of them pissed off. Galen Baker, I was such a rebel. Elizabeth is a family name, and I just didn't want to use it at all. Because in kindergarten, if if it's they call you by your first name. So I wouldn't give it to them because I wanted to be called Galen. And who is Galen in your life? It's just a very original name that my mother made up and and I loved it. And then when I was in my late 20s, early 30s, I had I was doing I was teaching yoga and meditation and I was doing some healing and a woman that I was working with said wow you're really living up to your namesake and I said who is that and they said she said Galen the Greek physician so then a, a psychic told me that I was a direct lineage of Galen the Greek physician so I went back and I really studied Galen, the Greek physician. First of all, I did something very foolish. I said, he had a very hard time with his personality because he would just walk over, walk in and take over. Well, I've done that all my life and I've had a really difficult time with my personality. So I went out into the ethers like an idiot and I said, to Galen, uh, you handle the healing and I'll handle the personality. And then I had to work my butt off because we both had real problems. People got very upset with me when I was younger because I would just walk in and I would take over and I would know how to do things. And, you know, I uh, people got very upset with me a lot. And, and so I really had to work at finesse. And Which what I, you think, and at what point did you say you then introduced your name Elizabeth back into your name? When I was 50 years old, I had a dream. And in the dream, an angel with a flaming sword came and said, Now that you're restoring your soul, you must restore your name. And it so impressed me that I got up from bed. I was just living in this. I've never had any money because I've just done what I wanted to do. And I was living in this little place and I got up and I went to the closet and I took out everything that only belonged to Galen Baker and didn't belong to Elizabeth Galen Baker. And I gave it away. I gave those clothes away. And I started using Elizabeth Galen Baker when I was 50 years old. Whoa. Wow. I'm so interested in this because, and why I'm so drawn to you and your story is that you have this energy and this, this both kind of combination of playfulness and determination, which I find really attractive, but you're shaking things up. You're rewriting things, the things, the expectations that you have about people and time and all kinds of interesting things. And for uh, I was leading these courses called Wish Class, and one of our first exercises was what is the meaning of your name and the relationship that we have to our names. And in some cases, it could be names that we rejected, we reinvented, or that we never really liked, or that we loved. And it's funny because it is the moniker that people are identifying with our ourselves, with our energy. Their, how they think of us is associated with a name. And so I think with your permission, perhaps we'll position you as Elizabeth Galen Baker, honoring this journey that you've been on, this really interesting journey of your name. Yeah. And here's something that's really funny. I was just on my way at that point to make the first documentary to save that last wild herd. I had a phone call. You love this. I had a phone call at six o'clock in the morning from a Lakota elder saying that 
they had talked to the star children going around the earth in the space capsule. And that was always guiding the tribe and that those star children had told them to call me and tell me that I was responsible for making the documentary that was going to save that last wild herd of bison at Yellowstone National Park. Six o'clock in the morning, my phone rang with this message. And I said, you, he said, we have a letter from them. And I took the dictation, it was just one page. And it said, we gave you a job to do on planet Earth, all of you humans, that uh, of taking care of the animals, and you're not doing it. And now we're going to tell you that you better do it, because if you don't start really taking care of the animals, and we expect you to make a documentary to save our bison. And... Um, I so I if I'd had any sense, I mean, I've been in the film business. If I'd had any sense at all, I would have said, "Well, what's your budget, or how do I get paid, or something?" But I didn't say any of that. I simply said, "I'll do it," and I I'll do it. Hung up the phone, and then I started researching what was happening to the bison at Yellowstone National Park, and then I made a. Uh, nine minute film that anybody can see on YouTube. It's called When Buffalo Roam. It won the New York International Independent Film and Video Festival and started my whole career as a filmmaker. I and see. it also saved that last wild herd of buffalo at Yellowstone. That took about 10 years, but I went in and people had been taking videos of the slaughter that was taking place by the Department of Livestock. I got those films. I, I didn't, I, a woman came after I'd been working on it for no money at all for about nine months and knew what I wanted to do. A woman showed, I told a friend of mine who's going to be here on Thursday, by the way, that I've known for about 40 years. And she told a woman and that woman had a house in Malibu and she came and and said, you know, I, I told her what I wanted to do. And she said, what do you need? And I said, the only thing I need is the money. And so she said, well, here's the money. And we went to Yellowstone and we made that film. And it has say, you know, they Congress, the wonderful um, senator that was in charge of environmental got his hands on it. And they are now the mammal of the United States. And even though people are still not clear on that story, the story was that they had brucellosis and that that was the excuse for shooting them. And uh, they don't have brucellosis and that isn't an excuse for shooting them. And Teddy Roosevelt bought the Yellowstone acreage so that they could wander out in the winter because they're nomads. Mm -hmm. They wander out in the winter and, and graze there outside of Yellowstone and they, and the ranchers started shooting them. And it's tragic, it's our tax money and it's their park and the park rangers were bribed and uh, started helping them and whatnot. But we, we, we pretty much stopped that. They had killed something like 1800 and they were just sh shooting them and letting them lie there and rot. And oh my God, I mean, it, it, it's, it's a heartbreaking nine minute film that one best documentary short in New York it it was the best thing that ever happened to me as far as a filmmaker. And it was um, pretty good for the Buffalo too. I would say so. Elizabeth, we just dove right in. I, I didn't even start the podcast. I'm so delighted that we recorded this and that, that you are such a disruptor. You're so open and I so admire you. And for, for people that are looking at the, watching the video of this podcast, Behind you is this extraordinary painting of a bison. 
So can you just tell us a little bit about the story of that, of that painting? It's yeah. It's just gorgeous. I, yeah. I, about um, 10 years maybe after I worked all of that for the Buffalo, I walked into uh, my Unity Church one morning and um, they were having a picture sale and I, that picture was there. And I said, oh, I have to have that. Yes. So I it's have just it. beautiful. And I, I, I have it and I, um, and I have it behind my head so that the buffalo can take care of me. I feel very protected. I had never even seen a buffalo or a wild buffalo before all of this happened. Can I ask, I'm just so curious, how did that um, gentleman get to have your phone number? How were, how were you even on their radar? I have no idea. That, it's just, I just, it's beautiful. Uh, I mean, it's I, just I, unbelievable. I did go, I did go, I, I did go to an extraordinary meeting in South Dakota or North Dakota, one of them. I'm sorry, I sound like a tidwick, but I I I heard about um a meeting that the Lakota Indians were having because the time had come to to talk about the real happenings uh and the link between uh aliens who have been protecting the earth by going around in space uh, spaceships and the old ancient teachings and i knew i had i was doing a little thing on the internet when the internet long before the internet was anything like it is now it had just started no ads you know and you had to do all of this calling up and whatnot but yeah. i decided that i was going to conduct I was going to create a magazine called an internet magazine called Spirit Matters. Oh, what a good name. Yeah, wasn't that wasn't that a great name? And and so I decided that I had to go and do interviews at that meeting. And that was extraordinary. It was in a school it was a weekend in a school and we were in the school auditorium and there was a leader there whose name was Galen. What? Yeah. And, and they said, and it had been a drought for about seven months and it was just dry. It was so dry. You couldn't even imagine it. And they stood up and said that they were going to create rain and they went up on the stage and started and they dimmed all the lights and they started this wild kind of yelling and dancing and singing and whatnot and a, a deluge a deluge of rain started and as we're walking out at and and it's led by Galen. And as we're walking out of the auditorium, uh, some idiot white person. I, I mean, I just think we're idiots. It, the truth is, you know, I I, I I say that with all love. Yeah. But we're just so snooty and thinking that we yeah. know everything. I'm walking out, and there are some people behind me saying, "Well, maybe it would have rained anyway." Really, people. Really. I know, you know, it's like, come on, wake up. Wake everything up. is everything with such love. And at the end of that, at the end of that meeting, an Indian man with a long braid came up to me with a beautiful feather and he bowed and just gave me the feather. It was, it was really pretty wild. So I was at that before looks for buffalo floyd looks for buffalo han who was a lakota elder uh came and you know called and said so i guess that's how they knew how to reach me 
it's that, really i mean the the alignment and and signs the coincidences the listening the trusting the taking action you know i we don't know each other that well we're getting to know one another and i'll talk a little bit about how we met but my i'm so grateful that people like you exist who are willing to buck the trends and break the conventions and live in in this wildly spontaneous way to bring hope and possibility and action to the ideas that just to just to heed the calling you know heed the calling and um and not overthinking it which which many people do um because uh, society has uh taught us that that's how things are done but you know here you are someone just saying okay yes and like let's go figure it out in this improvisation called life but to such a giving extent and i had not i have not yet seen the where the buffalo roam is that correct the name no, of the it's when buffalo roam when in buffalo, buffalo roam. roam and it's okay. only nine minutes long okay and it's on the bottom you can you can just click on the bottom of my email it's okay on the bottom of my email Okay, wonderful. I will put links to all of this in the show notes so everyone can enjoy it. But last night I had the pleasure of seeing another documentary film that you created called We Know Not What We Do. And in the same way that you commented on the silliness of our uh, of ourselves is um, in that same vein of we know not what we do. And yet, I really feel that right now is such a potent time to bring our awareness to new ways of thinking, new ways of being, being the change agents that we actually must be to be the caretakers of this earth. So let's jump ahead or take us from when you created that documentary film to creating um, We Know Not What We Do, which is an hour long film that again, I will put the link to be able to watch, which you, you so generously shared with us because I was so moved by both the urgency of the message, but also having it be infused with hope. And, uh, and that we can, in fact, with our innovation, our creativity, our commitment, and our caring, uh, help save this precious, precious planet. You know, it's such a interesting thing to me because this all started when I was very young and I got hurt and I was in a coma for about three weeks. And uh, when I came out of it, I was just outside the box and I never was able to get back in. And I really tried at times because I'd say, oh my God, can I just have a normal job or can I just get a job at minimum wage and keep it or something? I, I've never been able to. and. Now, I honestly think you, you just put your finger on it. You said society has taught us. This world, and, and this is really my message, I, I realize now. Uh, this world that most of us live in is simply an illusion. It, 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 it looks like it's real and there's an awful lot of agreement about 8 billion human beings now on the planet or more that are agreeing that this is real, but it isn't, it isn't real. It, it's just what the, it's a construct that we have created and it's more, it, I'm sure that at the time we did it, it was probably all for the best of all possible goods for human beings. You know, we didn't want to get eaten by dinosaurs or whatever, but it it's not working now. Mm -hmm. And it's sort of been taken over by thugs. And, and, and I honestly believe that we are rising and that this world is falling apart and most people are very alarmed by it and I'm cheering. I think it's wonderful because I think the world that is going to come, the new construct that we're going to be living in has been 
is so much more better, so much richer and fuller and bigger. And, you know, uh, we've yeah. been in this little bitty box. Yeah. And, and I we was can't stay there. Yeah. I was just interviewing someone and she called it the prison of our own making. And I think that, and I, I am, I'm curious and I wonder if that three week coma as a young child gave you in this lifetime an experience of being on the other side in an ethereal place. Many people have reported in that coma like place where you can venture to the other side. Perhaps you drank some of that energy, brought it back with you to have you have remained having contact with just another way of thinking, another way of being, tapping into all kinds of invisible energies that are present and available to us all the time. If we knew how to tap into that, if we knew and trusted and believed and surrendered and allowed ourselves to go into what some may call a quantum field or infinite possibility or collective consciousness. But I happen to be of the same mindset that it's sometimes even in our human existence that when we're confronted with a terrible challenge, that's when we grow and expand. And without the resistance of the actual challenge itself, things just stay the same because you don't know. Uh, I, you know, when, uh, when we met, we didn't know each other at all. You were coming up the stairs and I greeted you like an old friend. And now I realized that that was true. Uh, we tried to give it an excuse. You look like mm. my drama teacher, blah, blah, blah. We really are wonderful old, old friends. Mm. And, and we live in the same place because you know all of this. Yeah. And uh, the reason you're delighted with me is because you don't see a lot of people who actually just create from that space yeah. instead and live in that space. I demand of myself. I've worked hard to heal. It's not that I haven't had trauma. It's not that I haven't had uh, a, a difficult, the same kind of, you know, a little variation here and there, but whatever your story is, we all have those stories. Yeah. If you work really hard, you can develop a muscle. And what I mean by ground zero is in this moment. Mm. Now, the, 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 the infinite now. The infinite now. Mm. It's not what I'm going to do next week or who I'm going to meet at eight o'clock tonight. We don't even know I'm going to be alive at eight o'clock tonight. We don't know that any of you who are listening are going to be alive at eight o'clock at night. That used to scare the hell out of me. Yeah. But now I realize that that is a great gift. You know, that's a great gift from the divine. Whoever thought up this crazy game that we're playing. Yeah. That, that's a great gift because it helps you to just stay right here in the now, this minute, and then this minute, and then this minute, and then this mm -hmm. minute. And, and uh, I, and I feel, I mean, I'm, what drew me to you was, yes, you did greet me with a radiant smile in a party that I showed up late at for a movie premiere of a friend of mine. And I had already seen the movie. So I was only going to the after party and I come up the stairs and you are just beaming at me. And I was like, yay, who's this person making me feel like a million bucks. And yes, there was a story that I look just like your acting teacher, but what really drew me in was once we talked was this childlike, um, energy that you just radiated, which is of course like nectar to me. And also when I even heard your story, I think the, the little bit that I knew about your environmental activism, your documentary filmmaker, and then I was literally blown away when I heard that you are a cast member on the TikTok phenom called Retirement House, which is essentially a cast of five people, I'm assuming you're in your 80s-ish. And, um, but, you know, acting like, you know, a millennial dancing around on tables and carrying on and having a great time. And the reason why that I love that in particular is not so much that like the gag of it, but I think we are in a really potent teaching time about what it means to age 
and you are turning that story on its head in the most phenomenal way with 5 million plus followers on TikTok, that means that you're showing young people, hey, we're here having a blast. We're here in, in life, strong, dynamic, hilarious, fun. And to me, what an antidote, what a teaching, what a profound human teaching that's masquerading as like social media entertainment. Right. And and there's six of us and we range oh, six. 72 to 86. And, <laughs> and, and, and we're having a blast and we film all the time. And we're now doing a national podcast on YouTube and it's called Retirement House. And it is an opportunity to reach out. You know, that's been one of the constructs where old people are old and you shun them away and mm -hmm. blah, blah, blah. And young people are the only ones with any energy and all of that nonsense. Yep. And uh, we are really turning it on its head. We yep. were all over CNN yesterday and apparently, or no, Sunday, and then apparently yesterday it was all over cbs yeah and, you, and you had that big article just come out in the new york times yeah yeah, yeah. and we, you see so you talk about the new construct of the world and if someone's listening or watching and they're like but what does that actually mean this is what it means this is it means that means. you are showing and sharing a new way of thinking when someone wakes up and says, oh my God, I have never thought about that because I think of my grandparents as like old and out of touch, but here they are trending on TikTok more than anything that I've seen, or here they are showing how strong they can be in their bodies. And I look at, you know, the internet and maybe it's because I'm in my, you know, I'm 51. There's all this talk now about menopause that, of course, has been happening forever. But you see how the conversation and the, the rethinking and the sharing of information, empowerment and support around this time in one's life, it's, it shows that people are evolving their thinking. So we have, we have this ripeness that's happening right now that people can really take advantage of. I think that the earth I don't know how to describe this. And in fact, I don't know how to describe it because I don't know how it's really happening. But I believe with all my heart that the earth is lifting now, that it's going into a higher frequency. And Agreed. that our only job, our only job is to hold that frequency. That's our job. I there love isn't it. Another one. There isn't anything for fame or for money or for, you know, da, or do this or da, 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 or get your retirement or no, hold that frequency because that's the only hope there is for the human race. I mean, we're really, we're in the sixth stage of extinction. We are really close to not being here and people get so worried about AI. Well, I happen to think that AI is divine intervention in order to save the human race. I do. And I've been told, you'll love this, <laughs> you'll love this, but Flora de Mayo, one of the 13 grandmothers that has been touring the earth for peace, told me, it, ran out of gas in Santa Fe, <clears throat> happened to have my phone number. I went over and picked her up. We're sitting in front of the fire. This was about 10 years ago, I think. And she told me that I had come back from the future because I was a perfect example of AI and human merging and that I was half AI and half human and that I was here to help people in this time of elevation of the earth. I dig that. I deeply dig that. Yeah. I'm like, why not? Absolutely. And I, I think at the time I was sort of, but now I realize she's right. And not only that, but I'm RH negative blood. And about two years ago, they came out with an article saying that they weren't sure that RH negative zero blood was even human. Well, I laughed and laughed. I, I said, well, that explains everything. You know, we talked about like, again, humans, we know not what we do. I think there's something um, just an inherent humility 
of there's just so much we don't know. And the minute we think we do know, you have to start laughing because we just don't know. We, we don't, don't know. know. We don't know anything. We gave the sun that name. We gave the moon that name. We gave yeah. Earth that name. We, we, you know, we know nothing. Yeah. And the only sad thing about the only thing really threatening humans these days, I think, is that we think we know everything. Exactly. So I think that this part of holding a frequency. So let's talk about that a little bit because I want to make sure that people, you know, you and I kind of have a shared language together, a shared understanding. It's like, you know, when you meet your people. Um, but I think that there's, what does that actually look like in very practical terms? Uh, this idea of holding that energy and, and from, well, let me ask you, what, what does that look like in your life? Like practically, what does that, what, how does that show up for you? Well, the moment that coincidences stop, the moment that I'm irritated with something, the moment that uh, I I see that little squiggle going across my brain, making a judgment about mm. somebody, uh, I instantly now know that I'm I'm not holding the frequency. Yes, the frequency is that we are all in this together. Mm. All of us. Yeah. And for all the shortcomings that many of us have, you're part of the circle. You know, we're all in this together. And when you really allow that to wash over you, it creates a sort of frequency. I wish I had a better, you know, I, I'm going to really work at having a better explanation. Uh, it, there's, a, there's a movie that was made called Frequency uh, a long time ago, actually. Um, but it, it really, um, it's almost a buzz. Yeah, I know what you're saying. You know, it's almost a buzz inside of you of of life. Yeah, there's the uh, simple joys of life. Yeah, and even and, uh, I was walking the other day in my neighborhood a couple of days ago, and my son and I walked by this older couple who they actually had walkers. They actually looked very fit, and I think they were using their roller walkers just for additional stability. And we had this just brief exchange, just a hello exchange. And I was commenting on their, their cool, they actually, they were quite cool. These little, these little scooters and just the exchange of hellos with us, those strange, those strangers made me feel so grateful. Like there's a feeling of connection that that to me is part of that equation of the, um, that's what's missing in our lives. So the missing, I think we can identify you articulated it beautifully, the squiggle in your mind, the irritation, <laughs> excuse me, the judgment, the, the comparing, the, the, you know, the nagging, nudging thoughts that keep us kind of suppressed, unhappy, feeling down, depressed, the extent of that, the expansion of that, you know, depression or anxiety. But even if it's just the nudge where you just feel down or heavy or, you know, kind of not good. The opposite of which feels so available to us, but we've forgotten that it's actually the simplest thing that puts us back in a higher frequency. Right. A smile, a phone call, um, a sitting and reading a book or whatever, whatever that thing is that just kind of lifts your heart. Play some John Denver music on Spotico or, you know. Spotify, Yeah. It's John like, Denver. I was humming the other day James Taylor songs because I used to listen to that as a kid. But music, this today I, I spent five minutes hula hooping in my backyard to music. There's just something about play, creativity, joy, friends, uh, even strangers that reminds you, oh my God, this is the nectar of life. Right. This is actually the sweet. Oh, I know, I know. It just came. The light bulb just turned on. Authenticity. Mm -hmm. Authenticity is 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 the key because you when you're down and you're and you're pretending that you're not down, then you've lost it. You lost it. 
you and know, it's if, interesting if when you down, talk- you have to say, wow, I'm really down today and I feel terrible. And, and I, I, could you help me? Could you smile at me? Could you hug me? Could you, what, you know, what can I do? Any, any, you, it's, it's authentically being who you really are. Yeah. And, and I think your, your example of that in life is a great balm. It's a great example because sometimes let's say they grew up where they were, they were modeled behavior that was about worrying. You know, you got to have this career because you got to make sure you pay the bills or you got to make that, you know, degree worth it, or you have to be this kind of parent or my kids have to be big. Anyway, if you have those models around you, you think that's what life is, which is why it's so beautiful that even sort of the higher frequency of retirement house that we're just going to, you know, I don't know why they created it. They probably just thought this will make a great trending, huge, whatever. But I feel that you see the, the genuine joy and the breaking of the norms and the consciousness of what does it mean to, you know, have people who are retired. It's a great teaching and it wakens people up that, oh, wait, there's a different way. So here's where I see the trend of, of social media and where it can be tricky, right? You have to decide which path you go down. You can take the red pill or the blue pill, little matrix <laughs> reference. But are you going to use that, that experience of social media to fall into a compare and despair place to think, well, who am I going to do that? You know, that's them. They, they're, they're more talented or can speak more easily or whatever. So I'm going to stay quiet. Or do you use that to find what Mel Robbins just called on her podcast, a North star. And a right. North star is something that you see that can, that is shining light, that is guiding you, almost attracting you, that then you can then use as a form of emulation and inspiration. And so as I walked up those stairs, when we met the first time, you were that North star, you were this like, you know, radiating light person that ma- that touched my light. And I went, yay, I want to get to know you. And we created a circumstance where we could have a longer conversation. And I learned your story. And I was like, that's it. We have to take this, you know, go deeper. And I agree with you on a side note. I'm sure you and I are actually old, old friends who are now interacting again, which is great. But I think that your example, your light, your messages are so needed right now. So needed right now. We, with, we know not what we do. Here's a book that I wrote about the making of that film. And the way I got to make the film is that I had made two documentary films and they both had won awards. And so a, a young man, a trust fund baby from Albuquerque, Aaron Taylor, called me one day and my son, Adam Zirkel, who I adore, I was living in New Mexico at the time. He was living in LA and he came for one day and I was with Adam and I had blocked out everything. I didn't want to do anything except be with Adam. Mm. And the phone rang and it was Aaron Taylor saying, I see that you've earned two documentary film awards would you please tell me how to make an award-winning documentary film? And I said, I, I'll tell you how to make it. I'll tell you the easiest way to make it. Go get the money and hire me and I'll make it for you. Because I didn't want to spend any time on the phone. Oh, that's hilarious. And to my amazement, he called three weeks later and said, okay, I have the money. Will you make the film? And that was the film, We Know Not What We Do. Yeah, and it's a love letter to human beings. It's not statistics. It's straight from the heart and straight to the heart that we know not what we're doing, but we need to wake up and realize that if we don't make a moral and spiritual shift in the way that we live on this planet, that we're going to be extinct. Not the planet. The planet is going to survive. Sure. Maybe if we start throwing nuclear, you know, the ones that have been thugs and monsters and all of that, they're getting pretty nervous and they're threatening nuclear war again now. Yeah. 
it, even even you know the even I I suppose we can do a lot more destruction even than we have done, but we're doing a pretty good job on our own. And you know why? Because we think that money is more important. Money is not life. Money is energy. It's fun. Yeah. You can buy bubble gum with it, you know, but it isn't life. And right. priceless. We need to make a moral and spiritual shift in the way that we have been living and thinking about things. If we do not choose, choose to be extinct. So mm -hmm. I made the film, and I'm telling you, boy, Mother Earth just it was a magnet right here. And I, I knew not in the very first chapter, after I signed the contract to do it, uh, they walked out and I started yelling uh, to the room I was in, how in the world am I going to make a little documentary film about a subject this big? Yeah. Unfortunately, um, whoever that spirit is, sent a crane and picked me up and said, oh, you do it this way. And I was so, boy, I would, I, I would say, here's the name. Oh, well, maybe we should discuss. No, there's no discussion. I mean, I was so focused. And I cry when I see the movie now because I think the thing that makes me happiest is that I never lose my focus. You know, some documentary films get into about the second or third or fourth chapter, and all of a sudden they lose their focus and they sort of waver here and waver. Not with this film, man. Uh, I just... No, it's really beautiful. It's really a powerful film. And, and again, you walk that razor edge of letting people see for themselves how precarious a situation we're in while also offering the lens of hope and change and, and action. So I, I, I think that is an incredibly delicate and um, commendable uh, uh, position and, and creation that you've, that you've done. It's amazing. And I encourage everybody to watch it. You will love this. You will love this story. We were going, we lived in New Mexico. We were flying to LA to talk to someone about funds. We were headed back. I left my computer with all of my notes on the on the trolley thing. And when I got to the airport and opened my bag, it had men's shoes in it and and papers that I'd never seen. I couldn't believe what had happened. Suddenly I realized I'd taken the wrong bag off the wrong computer bag. And and so Aaron and his wife had to get home to their babysitter and I was left in LA and I took me about four or five hours to get out. I won't even try to tell you, you know, they say if, if you have the wrong bag or da -da, I got my bag back, they wouldn't take the other bag. The police wouldn't take the bag. I, I mean, the airport police, they say, just turn it in. No, no one would take. Anyway, I finally got on a plane. This is about now one o'clock in the afternoon. I get on a plane. I, I get off in Phoenix because there are no more nonstops in New Mexico. I get off in Phoenix. I have lunch. I go and I open my book. I was reading McKenna's book about uh, about environmental change. And a man walked by and said, how do you like that book? And I said, it's scaring the hell out of me. How did you like it? And he said, if, if, it, if you want to know about what's happening, you have to come to uh, do the, make a report on the Keystone. Yeah. And. And that's how I met the man that got me to the Keystone to the, make that whole portion. I didn't even, I didn't even know. I said, what's the Keystone? I thought that maybe it was because your prior documentary and your connection with the Lakota community. No, it was because I left. I picked you left up your the, bag. Oh, the only time in my life I got the wrong bag. I had to be in LA. I mean, the delicacy of yeah, the delicate, the perfection actually. 
Yeah, uh, of opening that book. Otherwise, if I'd had any other book, he would have walked right by. He would never have talked to me, but he saw the book I was reading. He was He's a wonderful man who you saw in the film. He said, you have to come to the Keystone. And then I almost took it out because I was supposed to go in January and it was 23 below and 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 thank God I didn't chicken out and I went and I and saw that I, snow. Woof. Yeah. And when and whenever I was filming and interviewing, everyone said, what are you going to do when Obama okays the Keystone? And very strongly, I said he won't OK it. I had no idea what I was saying, but it, out would come this voice. Obama's not going to OK the Keystone. No. And even when Trump tried to OK it. Didn't do it. And not those today, guys Sam. won. <laughs> and that means we won because that aquifer. Right. And I had no idea. To the entire United States. If they had I, I, I actually, I, I could not believe my jaw was dropped. Because I I was aware of Keystone, the XL pipeline, but I did not realize about the aquifer. I had heard about the water, of course, but I sort of was like, it was like a general knowledge, not the fact that there is this irreplaceable, precious resource that this entire country, let alone the world, relies upon. That the that the 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 insanity. And even even the 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 strip mining that you're showing, it, I mean, it is just like, all right, enough is enough. Enough is enough. And we have to, and here in California right now, one of the very precarious things that we're facing, and, and people just have to really understand that when we pass legislation that says that we are going to do progressive uh, changes in terms of energy. Um, not just conservation, but energy creation, renewable energy. All of that sounds wonderful. But by the same token, when we say, okay, but now the wind turbines go here and the solar fields go here and everyone says, I don't want that. I don't want to rest up, mess up the, the, the environment. We have to all come together as stewards of this land to compromise. Because, you know, we just have to come up with all of these delicate, delicate changes and that we can weave a solution so that we don't just get mired in um, political, you know, quagmires that doesn't move us forward. We don't have time for that anymore. No. So we have to, we have to find this dance and a shared vision, a, really a shared vision. Um, Cause that's where we are. That's where we are. And because it was so cold in January, a cameraman and I went back to uh, Omaha to uh take pictures make films of beautiful uh b-roll we call it right yeah film uh beautiful b-roll to uh put in the film mm. and that's when we got invited to rosebud reservation and the irony of that is that um uh, uh Rosalie Little Thunder, who had appeared in When Buffalo Roam, was from Rosebud. Oh, Rosebud. wow. Oh, but wow. She had passed on. She wasn't there when we got invited back. But that's when we, uh, you know, and and Na I don't know if you realize it, but Native Americans have such a sense of humor. They came out and they said, the leader of our uh, of five, 562 tribes are going to be um the person that you interview today they invited us there i a, a, a white girl with a camera i i mean it's a deeper it, knowing it's just you know? it's just a deeper <laughs> and and so we went and out came um I mean, I didn't know whether or not it was a joke, but we set up the camera, we got all ready, and then we had the extraordinary privilege of uh, interviewing uh, the chief and the shaman of 562 tribes. And, and, and he really, his spirit really helped me with the film. 
And mm. that's in the book that his spirit really, really helped. Uh, I had he he helped me in dreams as to how to put it together. It it was a life changing wow. experience for me to make that film, starting from I didn't know a damn thing about what I was doing to uh, to a dream sequence at the end uh, after I had already finished the film, a dream sequence that uh, just life changing just absolutely life-changing. Well, I can't tell you what a privilege it is to um, tell your story, to share your, and hear your story, to celebrate your story. And that I'm just so tickled that you're now in my life uh, because I, I can't wait to see what else the universe has in store for you. <laughs> yeah, I can't either. And look, here are my wonderful- Yes, you've got your- Wonderful wish beads. And yes. the very moment that we did the workshop, all of a sudden, I it opened up for me and I put my little wishes in there. And uh, I just want to give a shout out to everyone that if they haven't gotten some of your wish beads, this one was given to me uh, as a, um, a, a bracelet to help me um, open up to all of those messages and this one is uh somebody gave me for strength and this one is creation and passion and i think they look so cool together don't you oh they i think they look absolutely stunning i think they look stunning and i i i'm really excited to have this journey together and individually just unfold and delight in whatever is meant to be um, I think that you are a shining example of breaking all the norms and being an out of the box, not only thinker, but doer, creator, and also that people get to feel your energy in the wildest way through your work on Retirement House. So whether they consciously know what they're delighting on, you're exuding that energy, which is a message that is, you know, touching their hearts and minds, which is really part of this journey of elevating our consciousness of bringing in this new dimension of possibility and learning how to be truly caretakers of ourselves of our communities and certainly our planet where where do you where do these podcasts appear they're they anywhere where you can yeah so they're on my website so you can certainly look at them at wishbeats.com under the learning tab you can see all of our podcasts listed we also post them on our youtube channel and they are also hosted wherever other podcasts are hosted. So you can even find them on Spotify, for example. Wow, that's yeah. wonderful. Yeah, and it's just an honor and privilege. I, I get to selfishly have long conversations, which are recorded with people that I admire. <laughs> so that's, that's great. Yeah. And I, and I want to finish that sentence of telling people that one, one of the ways that can really help you, there are these beautiful wish beads on Alexa's uh, website and you can order them and they, uh, and, and she has it listed what it's for. The and meaning I, of the stones. Yeah. Yeah. And I just think that that is a marvelous, these little symbols and things really help you, you know, manifest strength, passion, creativity. Um, they really, they really work. They really yeah. let the radio help you. Let the song, if you're looking for an answer, if you're writing and you're stuck, pick up a book. What's the first sentence you see? You know, it's, it's like the universe loves you. Mm -hmm. That's what we have lost sight of because we're all so angry at each other. The universe loves you and the universe will rush in and put its arms around you and it will dance with you. And it's the best dance partner in the whole world. <laughs> Amen. Well, if that's not a ringing endorsement for wish beats, but more importantly, the wish work journey, I don't know what is because <laughs> there's magic that happens when you ask for what you desire. And then the universe conspires to help you achieve that. And it also 
is the intention behind it is for you to awaken to your own magic. The wish beads are just a reminder of that magic, but the magic That's is right. yours. The yeah. magic is yours, but the wish beads really helps you to remember that. Yeah. I look down and I see these and I just think they're so cool and it helps me to remember who I am. That's awesome. Hey, I want to wrap up by sharing with you something that I just decided on officially, officially yesterday. Okay. And that is, I have a big wish. Now you're you're dialed into the universe in, in really cool ways. And it came about many years ago, but on September 23rd, 2023, so just a few short months from now, I've set the intention to have a million people wishing at one time. We're going to do an interactive art activation, but where I'm standing right now on Tuesday, June 20th, I actually have no idea how the universe is going to conspire to support this intention. But when we talk about elevating the consciousness of the world, we're actually creating a process where people can choose seven different intentions of wishes for the world, and they can add their personal intention, and we're going to create a co collective artwork an experience we call wish as one, but it's this year, September 23rd, 2023. And right now I'm saying universe, show me how we're going to make this happen. Yes. And I'm saying, Alexa, I will help. Yay. That's so cool. Well, you know, and so it shall be. And it is, you know, and the meaning of our logo, which I just am announcing, uh, we just posted a new video about, but the actual the logo mark, the red logo mark with that symbol, the symbol is the Japanese kanji for wish granted, meaning wow. it's a done deal. So oh, that's great. Yeah. So it, it's reminiscent of the, the sign of the woman. It's also reminiscent of the Egyptian Ankh. It's also echoing the sentiments of our company, the sort of uh, meaning of our company, embracing the notions of the Japanese concept of wabi-sabi the art of imper imperfection and um, and Kaizen, which is the art of continual improvement. And so this idea of these concepts all sort of magically coming together, um, I'm working with a wonderful woman and she's like, Alexa, you just like, let's just share the magic of wish beads by you actually sharing right here that yes, on my birthday, on May 15th, I said, we're gonna do this thing. And now we're going to start sharing, like, let's figure out how to do this. Why not? That's so that's what's, great. that's what's cooking. Yep. Good. That's yeah. good. And I want us to get together physically, I, regardless yeah. of whether it's for lunch or whether it's a walk on the beach or whatever the heck it is. Let's, uh, uh, you, you inspire and delight me as much as I inspire and delight you. Hey, it's a good community, this wishing community. It's 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 fun stuff. And when we get a little bit braver to introduce ourselves to new people, to have conversations, suddenly you realize like that is actually the nectar of life. It really genuinely is. So thank you, Elizabeth Galen Baker, in all your magnificence and your creativity, your endless youth. Um, it's just so fun to know you. Thank you, my darling girl. Thank you. I'm so glad we met. And if you want to spend time with the one and only Elizabeth Galen Baker, then join us for our upcoming virtual wish circle on Saturday, July 23rd from 12 to 2 p.m. Pacific time. And we are going to talk about creativity. We're going to talk about agelessness and eternal youth and energy, hope, possibility, and change. So join us for our virtual wish circle. There is a link to sign up in the show notes. And it's an opportunity for you to spend two hours together on Zoom, both creating your wish and also learning some of the insights about how you can bring the energy, the feeling of that wish into your life right now, while also taking steps towards making that wish come true in real life. So I hope you'll sign up for that. Of course, find Elizabeth on TikTok uh, at uh, Retirement House, and I will include links to her book and her documentaries inside the show notes as well. And thank you for sharing both her work wish beads, make some wishes, have the belief that we can in fact 
create the world that we want to live in, the world that everyone deserves to live in, full of hope and healing and happiness and community and all good things. All right, until next time. And and by the way, if you have a terrific wish story to share, go ahead and let me know, reach out um, and uh, message me on Instagram. You can write into hello at wishbeats.com and let us know that you've got a wish story to share if you want to be a guest on the podcast. All right, stay amazing. Until next time.